I'm going to start this nutrition series by covering red meat. We'll cover red meat and colon cancer, red meat and breast cancer, and red meat and heart disease. First, I'll start with colon cancer because it's the most common cause of cancer death in non-smokers in the U.S. and the Western world. The first study I'm going to review was published in 1990 in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a cohort study that tracked about 90,000 women. The subjects completed a very detailed food questionnaire in 1980 and were then followed for seven years. The highest 20% of red meat consumers were compared with the lowest 20% of red meat consumers. Red meat in this study and subsequent studies is defined as beef, pork, and lamb. Yes, I said pork. Despite the pork industry's marketing attempts to separate themselves from the beef industry, pork is considered to be a red meat. For the highest quintile of meat consumers versus the lowest quintile, the relative risk was about 2.5. That means they were 2.5 times more likely to develop colon cancer. For you statistics geeks, the p-value was 0 0.0005, which means that because the group that was studied was so large, there is less than a tenth of a percent that random chance could produce the same results. So we're very confident that high meat consumers do have a higher chance of colon cancer in this study. Next, another study was done with about 50,000 male health professionals comparing those that ate red meat more than five times per week versus those that don't eat meat and they had a relative risk of about 3.5. That's 3.5 times more likely to develop colon cancer, and the p-value is 0 0.005, which statistically means we're more than 99.5% certain that the results are true. What's a prospective cohort trial? It's when you follow a group of people over time and you compare them by certain conditions and you follow them for specific outcomes. So for an example, in this case, we're following people, comparing them by meat consumption and watching for colon cancer. These prospective cohort trials ask the participants to track a lot of details. For example, other aspects of diet, activity, obesity, alcohol intake, smoking status, aspirin intake. So they're able to compare for and control for potential confounders. They can compare people with like status. They can compare the smokers to the smokers, the overweight people to the overweight people, etc. By doing this, they try to compare people with the same risk factors except for meat consumption. There were lots more prospective trials done in the 1990s and early 2000s, and people were compared by lifestyle factor to see which lifestyle factors were related to the development of cancer. Here's one with about 30,000 women from Iowa, and this one has about 15,000 women followed from 1985 to 1991, and this one followed physicians, and this study followed about 30,000 Californians, and this study was done in the Netherlands. And this study pooled 87,000 nurses and about 45,000 other healthcare professionals. And this study has 37,000 people from Australia. And here's a study from Sweden with about 60,000 people. And here's a study published in 2005 that is much larger than the others with almost 500,000 participants from across Europe that will f were followed from 1992 to 1998. So as you can see, there are lots of studies that were done in the 1990s. I'm not going to bore you by going into the details of all those studies, but they showed a significant increase in colon cancer in people that eat red meat. Then the American Institute for Cancer Research and the World Cancer Research Fund published an in-depth study in 2007. A team of experts from around the world reviewed the studies we just reviewed. They noted that all of the studies show an increased risk of colon cancer with meat consumption. The databases were then pooled together into one database. This is called a meta-analysis, and it is a very strong form of scientific analysis. All told, over a million people were assessed, and comparisons were made of their lifestyle factors to see which factors were associated with colon cancer. One lifestyle factor stuck out from all the others, which was red meat consumption. Their report? The data is very convincing that red meat consumption increases the risk of colon rectal cancer. The database is so large and the effect is so great that the likelihood that the result is due to random chance is nearly zero. It is fact that meat consumers were more likely to develop colon cancer in these studies. There was about a 1.43 times increased risk of colon cancer per time that the study participants consumed meat per week. In other words, Consuming meat just once per week increased the risk of getting colon cancer by 43%, and the risk went up by 29% for each additional 100 grams of meat consumed per day. Why? 
When meat is cooked, toxins called heterocyclic amines and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are produced. Red meats produce more heterocyclic amines than other meats. These toxins are carcinogenic. Temperature is the most important factor in the formation of these toxins, so frying, grilling, and barbecuing generate the largest amounts because they use very high temperatures. And indeed, meats cooked with these methods were found to have the highest rates of colon cancer. There have been a lot more studies since 2007, and meta-analysis of these newer studies confirms the same thing, that people that eat a lot of red meat have a higher rate of colon cancer. How much red meat does it take to increase colon cancer risk? This study in 2009 addressed that question. It was a meta-analysis of the previous studies, but the focus of comparisons was on the amount of meat consumed and the risk of colon cancer. It found that even the smallest amount of meat that was recorded in the studies, 50 grams, was associated with an increased risk of colon cancer. In summary, the data is convincing that red meat consumption significantly increases the risk of colorectal cancer.